So I'd like to take you on a journey to teach you on swallowing, the influence of Parkinson's disease on swallowing, and what you can do yourself to improve swallowing. First, I'd like to thank Samantha and Jennifer and the whole team here for this invitation, because I'm truly honored to do this for you. It's my pleasure to be here for you. My daily work, oh, sorry, I forgot this. This is what Parkinson's can do, what you can do. This is the base of our presentation. My daily work is uh, studying people with uh, swallowing disorders. And later in my career, I was, became involved in working with people with Parkinson's disease. So the combination swallowing and Parkinson's is what we are discussing today, here for you. Usually on a Saturday, I'm busy with cleaning our hen house. <laughs> so for you to know, and later in the presentations, the hens will come back and give you also a small demonstration. The Netherlands is a very small country in Europe. Uh, we live in Nijmegen, it's the, in the eastern part of the Netherlands, uh, shown here. And the Netherlands is known for the cheese, for the bicycles. We do have cars, but it's a small country and it's flat, so we like to use bicycles. And we are famous for our water management. Half the country is below sea level. And of course, we're known for exporting uh, flowers, especially tulips, which are related to Parkinson's disease. And I dressed for the occasion for you. It's also can maybe relevant to know that our national color is orange. And I put it in here because when we have sports events, international uh, sports events, we all dress up in orange. Everyone dresses up in orange. And last week, weekend, we did it again because our women's soccer team became European champion. And we're very proud of that. This is a picture of Nijmegen, the city near the border of Germany, where the Radboud uh, University Medical Center is situated. This is the Radboud University Medical Center, and this is also home to Parkinson Net. And I'd like to explain you something about Parkinson Net so you understand a little bit more my background and our vision on treatment of Parkinson's disease. Parkinson Net is a national system of 70 regional networks. We trained more than 3,000 professionals in working with people with Parkinson's disease, 15 different disciplines. And the idea is that they work together in the region to work together around the patient and the caregivers uh, involved in Parkinson's disease. This is internationally now known as the Parkinson Net approach, and it has been studied uh, intensely and published in the highest scientific journals. Parksonet is partly based on guidelines. We developed through the years guidelines on physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, nutrition, nursing, and we also developed a multidisciplinary guideline for every discipline involved in Parkinson's and people in nursing homes. And this is a picture of the Dutch guideline on speech language therapy. In this guideline, we explain and give recommendations for speech therapists how to assess and treat people with Parkinson's disease in three domains, in speech, dysarthria, swallowing, uh, dysphagia, and drooling. But today, we'll discuss only dysphagia and drooling. To explain to you what the difference is in the domains in frequency, we ask a speech therapists in the Netherlands to... Um, uh, provide us with inf information which indications they see the most. And 83% uh, people come to a speech therapist for speech. In 50% they also have swallowing disorders or only swallowing disorders. And 33 the complaints regard drooling. But this talk is about adequate nutrition. I'll explain the swallowing, but the main goal is that adequate nutrition is vital. This is a picture taken from our own dinner table. And this is a picture I took from the internet, and I think that is your average uh, Thanksgiving dinner, <laughs> maybe. Um, and the typical thing is, in, in humans, because every living animal, bacteria, plant needs nutrition, that we as humans tend to share eating and drinking while we're together, especially in celebrating. When you celebrate a birthday, when you go to a wedding, it always involves eating and drinking. And that is what sometimes makes it complicated if you have a swallowing disorder. We'll come back to that later. This is a drawing from um, the digestive system, from the bottom 
uh, from the mouth to the bottom, from the mouth to your intestines, uh, etc. But I'm going to explain you only the part, because that is only my expertise, the part how you get your food and drink in your mouth and in your esophagus. That is what we are going to uh, discuss together in detail. Sorry, I first want the animation. Hunter, can you start? Here you see, in short, what is happening when you chew, start swallowing, it goes through, through, the, through your throat, the epiglossus is closing your airway, and it goes to your stomach. That's how it's supposed to be. Swallowing disorders, or the medical term dysphagia, can be divided in two main problems. The one problem is how to get it into your esophagus without residue, and the other problem, so if people are not able to do that, it, there's residue in the, in the throat. The other problem is to prevent getting it into the trachea, into the lungs. Or you can have both problems. So everything is circling around these two problems, the difficult to get it in, or the difficult to prevent to get it in the wrong pipe. In a broader perspective, it is important to know that swallowing disorders can have many, many causes. And Parkinson's disease is only part of one. The neurological disorders, uh, like stroke, for example, can cause um, severe dys dysphagia, but also Alzheimer's disease, um, Huntington's disease, multiple sclerosis, but also all muscle diseases can cause dysphagia mild or severe, like ALS, etc., but and other people have um, brain tumors or uh, traumatic brain injury. So all kinds of neurological diseases can have swallowing disorders as one of the consequences. But there are also non-neurological -neuro disorders um, that can cause dysphagia, like cancer in the mouth or in the throat. That's completely different from uh, the consequences in Parkinson's disease, respiratory disorders like COPD, chronic cough or infections or trauma. So that is what makes it so complex that there are many causes and within a disease it is complex to understand how the disease specifically influences the swallowing. What does Parkinson's disease do for you, I don't have to explain to you, of course, what is Parkinson's disease, but if to come uh, to the same level. Most presenters like to explain Parkinson's disease as the iceberg. What you see on top is the motor disorders, that is what you see. But below the water, what you don't see is even worse, or sometime, even um, bad to experience, or sometimes even worse. The motor disorders are hyperkinesia, rigidity, tremor, and postural imbalance. In summary, this makes you um, move small and slow. That is the short summary. The non-motor problems, the pain, depression, sleep disorders, cognitive decline, intestinal problems, if you suffer from that, what is related to swallowing is the difficulty with dual tasking. Dual tasking is doing two things at the same time. For example, talking while walking. They teach you not to talk while you walk, to concentrate on one thing, to focus on one activity. Is that true? Right. So it will come back during the lecture, small and slow and dual tasking, to explain swallowing disorders. In general, dysphagia, swallowing disorders, are not an early sign in Parkinson's disease. That is agreed um, upon um, uh, among neurologists, published uh, again a few years ago, that if people have swallowing disorders, severe swallowing disorders, in the first five years of the disease, it's a red flag for Parkinson's disease, which means that it's probably not Parkinson's disease, but an atypical Parkinsonism, a disease that looks like Parkinson's disease. These diseases, atypical Parkinsonism, um, may cause swallowing disorders early in the disease. So it is important to know that the Parkinson's disease doesn't have dysphagia early in the disease, but the atypical Parkinson's may have that. Like multiple system atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy, dementia with Lewy bodies, vascular Parkinsonism, etc. And you can also see if you're experienced in the way of swallowing, if it is hyperkinesia or something else. 
because hyperkinesia and rigidity cause slow chewing and swallowing, choking on liquids of food, or food getting stuck in the throat. Because of slow and small movements, hyperkinesia, not because of weakness. Because weakness is related to a typical Parkinsonism. For example, in MSAP, it's a combination of hyperkinesia and muscle weakness. In MSAC, it's a combination of hyperkinesia and poor coordination. In vascular Parkinsonism, we sometimes see apraxia or spasticity, also in swallowing. Or in PSP, we may see spasticity and impulsive eating and drinking. So for a speech pathologist, it's very important to also recognize the atypical Parkinsonism or recognize the motor behavior in chewing and swallowing because it's different for Parkinson's disease and not Parkinson's disease. Then how frequent are swallowing disorders in Parkinson's disease? Well, as always, that depends on how you assess it. A few years ago, we worked on a review to understand by comparing um, several studies how frequent swallowing disorders occur in Parkinson's disease. And when we, when we compared the studies in which they asked people, do you have a swallowing complaint? It was about a third, the blue part. About a third of people with Parkinson's, home living people with Parkinson's, I must say, that does not include people in nursing homes, about a third will admit, yes, I have swallowing disorders. However, when you do sensitive testing, it's completely different. More than two-thirds of people have swallowing disorders. So it depends on how you assess it. So on the one side, this may mean that some people with Parkinson's may not be aware of the swallowing problem, or the testing is very sensitive for very mild disorders, which for someone with Parkinson's is not a problem because his mobility or his sleeping disorders are much more important. So maybe both are correct, and we have to assess very carefully by asking both asking patients and assessing patients. So this comes to my first um, intermezzo or demonstration, a short demonstration of how we can assess with a very simple swallowing test, observed swallowing by people with Parkinson's. I have a volunteer. I actually have two volunteers. Frank, will you turn with me so to the camera so people can see you? Yes. Okay. K keep it here. I'll have my watch. Wait a minute. Because I'm going to keep the time. Okay. My request is to drink this water as quickly as you can, and I keep the time. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Well done. How many? <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm not done. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not done. Oh, oh, yes. You get a microphone so they can hear you. How many seconds was that? What do you think? Yeah, 13. Yeah, correct. Okay. Frank, do you experience problems with swallowing? No. Not at all. Not that I know of. No. Okay. Okay. No. Um, do you choke? No. On your food? No. Not at all. Not at all. Okay. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It was 13 seconds. But I do eat my food slowly and chew it. Okay. Okay. Now, this is a perfect demonstration of what I showed you earlier. Um, the difference between feeling complaints and assessment. Because I keep asking you, and now you say, well, I get slower. This is indeed for a man of your size, relatively slow. So this is a kind of sensitive testing and observation. So mm -hmm. I would say, yes, your swallowing is getting slower. Okay. So right. and, and you admit that your eating is getting slower. But is this a swallowing disorder? You don't experience this as a swallowing problem. No, I don't. No. Not yet. No. no. So that's the difference between how you experience what you feel or what I clinically might 
um, diagnosed as a mild swallowing disorder. Right, but it was speed it took me to swallow that. Yeah. <laughs> Should we try that again? Oh, 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 n now goes the challenge. <laughs> I'm sure you, you, you I, can speed I couldn't, it up. I couldn't gulp anymore, though. No, 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 no. no, no. And that is what the Parkinson's does with you. And that is yeah. why I wanted to demonstrate it. So we can do quite sensitive testing. But in this case, if you don't have a problem with your swallowing or chewing, only as um, slower during dinner, I would say spend your time and your energy on something else. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. That's where I'm spending my time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the demonstration. Because we also have discussed consequences of swallowing disorders. Some people may experience more coughing, change of food preferences, taking medication may become more difficult, dining takes longer, and some people might feel uncomfortable when dining, drinking, or celebrating with others. Whether this is a true problem for you, which you need therapy for, is for you to decide with your therapist. There are no rules. Another problem may be unwanted weight loss. If you have a swallowing disorder, that may cause inadequate intake of food or liquid, and if you don't have enough intake, you may experience unwanted weight loss and weakness, which aggravates the dysphagia. However, some people have poor appetite that may be related to a depression. A poor appetite is not related to dysphagia, but can cause the same problem. Or some people have increase of movements like tremor or hyperkinesia, which takes more energy. So you lose weight because you need more energy for all your movements. So it's a complex system. There may also be a risk of malnutrition in advanced stages of the diseases. And some people may need a feeding tube. But again, that's only in the advanced stages of the disease when it may be necessary. And another thing that many people worry about is the risk of aspiration pneumonia. And that's important to understand the pathophysiology of aspiration pneumonia. It is multifactorial, and that's what makes it complicated. Of course, if you aspirate regularly liquid food, saliva, or have reflux, so the content of your stomach comes up, um, that is maybe dangerous for your lungs. But if you can cough adequately, it's not that dangerous. The problem is the combination with reduced cough sensitivity and reduced cough intensity. If you're not able to cough it up efficiently, then it may be a problem. And also, people who are dependent in oral care, that means that um, sometimes the mouth is not clean enough, so you also, with aspirating saliva, you aspirate bacteria that may add to the risk of aspiration pneumonia. In general, it is true that aspiration pneumonia is the main cause of the disease, but that is true in the end stage of the disease, and that is true for all brain diseases. At the end stage of your life, your body just gives up. We sometimes see people with an aspiration pneumonia in the mid phases of the disease, but it, that is relatively rare. Usually, it's only in the end stage of the disease. Some short remarks about assessment and treatment. We can assess you from the outside and from the inside. The outside, I just demonstrated what we can do with clinical tests and observation. From the inside, we can use instrumental assessment like X-ray or um, put an endoscope in your throat. A short example of the X-ray is shown here. So we can see through you and see what happens when you swallow. That's one instrumental assessment. The other one is um, use an endoscope through your nose so we can observe what happens in your throat. And I will show you some examples later on. Finally, we can also uh, register muscle activity of the floor of the mouth, of the larynx, etc., in order to understand when people swallow, how do they swallow, etc. And this is a short example of how then it, it looks like on a screen. Patient is videoed, you see him swallow, but we can at the same time register his muscle activity. 
And then the final part of the assessment, um, the questioning. This is um, our few questions which are part of a standardized questionnaire which we validated for Parkinson's disease, in which we ask, do you have a problem and what is the severity of your problem? For example, uh, at the first question, how many times do you aspirate or choke on your food? Are you limited during drinking? Are you limited during eating? So we ask people to choose the right option and that gives us a summary score and an idea of the uh, severity of the problem. On the right, you see a few results from 126 people asked to do that. In the middle, you see the people with Parkinson's and on the far right, people with atypical Parkinsonism. Overall, people with atypical Parkinsonism have higher score, so they are worse in their swallowing. It's, and that's for all the questions we use. Also the questions, do you have difficulty with swallowing pills? Does your swallowing difficult limit you to your dining with others? Are you concerned about your difficulty with swallowing or how bothered are you as a result of your difficulty? The interesting thing is that the last question, how bothered are you, a third of people are bothered and that is similar to people with Parkinson's or atypical Parkinsonism. So this is one way of measuring the sensitivity of the problem according to the patient and caregiver. Then a short remark about treatment. Again, the goal is adequate and safe nutrition and we have two options, direct treatment, so looking for an effective compensation or cue or indirect treatment. When we use uh, exercises which have a positive side effect on swallowing. And finally, a remark about medical treatment. Unfortunately, medical treatment like levodopa or deep brain stimulation doesn't have a big effect on swallowing, neither negative or positive. So you largely depend on your speech pathologist. So then we are at the anatomy and physiology. I took a picture of this model and it's sliced um, in the middle so we can see the inside. And I'll talk you through the anatomy. These are our basal ganglia. This is the brainstem. This is the nasal cavity. This is your tongue. This is the base of your tongue. This is your velum. This is your throat or pharynx, this whole area. This is your epiglottis. These are your vocal cords. And all together, this is your voice box or larynx with the Adam's apple, which you can feel. Come back to that later. From your um, uh, larynx, we go into your windpipe or trachea, which go to your lungs. Behind it is your esophagus, and your esophagus is going to your stomach. I prepared a small handout for you to take home after this presentation, and I took four of the key slides, including this slide about anatomy. Some people would like to see that, that back. This is another anatomy slide to compare what I just explained with what the endoscope sees in your throat. So we'll go to the other side. Here you see again the tongue base. Here's the tongue base in the, in the model and here's the tongue base when you see it with the camera with the endoscope. This is the trachea. So here you see the vocal cords in the trachea. This is the epiglottis. And these are the vocal cords. And I'll show you in a video how it looks like when you uh, talk and when you sing. So what, how do your vocal cords look like? Can you start the video? These are your vocal cords. That's what it looks like. Okay. And another few videos, we're going to watch what happens in your throat when you swallow. This is another um, endoscopy of a patient with Parkinson's. 
And the interesting thing, we assess this patient for his swallowing, and uh, what I want to show you, and later on the rest of the, of the, um, the video of his swallowing, this is the tongue base, as you now know from the explanation. And um, when Hunter starts the video, you will see a tremor in the tongue base. So we are used to tremor in hands or feet, but you can also have a tremor of your vocal cords or a tremor of your tongue base. Can you start the video? You can't hear it, but, and we didn't realize, but just when we did the assessment, we saw the tremor of the tongue base. Thank you. It disappears when this patient starts to swallow because, as in your hands, it's a resting tremor. So the moment you start swallowing, the tremor is gone. So we're going to discuss chewing and swallowing in stages. I'll explain to you five stages. The first stage is how to get it into your mouth. The second stage is chewing, tasting, and bolus preparation. And important to realize is that during these stages, you can still breathe and if you like, talk. Then when you're done chewing and preparing your bolus, you stop chewing, you stop talking, breathing, and you start swallowing. It's one or the other. When you start swallowing, you push your food into your throat, and in the throat, the swallowing reflex takes over, and the swallowing reflex closes the way to your nose and closes with the epiglottis the way to your uh, trachea, and at the same time, it pushes down the food through the throat into the esophagus. So there are two things happening at the same time, and the airway and the foodway are crossing, and that is why we are all at risk for aspiration. What you see here in the model, with the red lace is going through the nose and into the uh, trachea, and the black lace is going from the mouth into the esophagus. Here you see this crossing. That is how we are designed. So next I'm going to discuss with you the stages again and more closely, what does the Parkinson's do and what can you do? First, into the mouth, how to get it into the mouth and what problems can you experience then? We use um, spoons, forks, we take bites, we use bottles, all kinds of techniques to get food and liquid in our mouth. We can use utensils or chopping sticks or we can eat with our hands. We eat fast food with our hands. In Asia, people we eat with our hands. In the Netherlands, we eat the herring with our hands. So eating with your hands is also normal behavior. We use all kinds of bottles, glasses, in all kinds of shapes. And if you're healthy, you don't have to think about a tremor or anything. You can drink from any glass, bottle, or whatever. But when you have Parkinson's disease, you may have a problem because of your tremor while using a fork, a spoon, or a glass. Or you may be slow in getting food in the mouth. Or you may have difficulty with drinking from small glasses or small cups or narrow glasses. I'd like to show you the video uh, on the left. That is a video of a patient who we saw a few weeks ago, and I wanted him to do the same swallowing test. Um, however, it, uh, in his hands he has a very floppy a plastic glass, and he says, I, I can't do that. This is going wrong. Show the video, please. And then suddenly, we saw the influence of his tremor. But he said at the same moment, well, at home, I have a heavy glass, a heavy mug, and that helps me. Um, it, then I ha have less difficulty because of my tremor. So... I video made another video of him an hour ago. Can you show me the left video, please? That's a heavy, full glass. And now we can drink. The tremor isn't gone, but it's better. And the day after, his daughter said, I'm going to make a video at home. Send me this video of the same man sitting in his garden, and I'll show you him sitting in his garden with his own mug. And 
illustration again, and I think he is watching us now. <laughs> so that works. And I'm going to show you other solutions found by patients themselves. Because, for example, if you have hypokinesia or weakness, it may be uh, helpful to use a white, thin-rimmed, light mug for easy drinking. The picture on the left was sent to me by um, the husband of a patient who said, at home it's going excellent, this is her mug, this is where she can drink from safely and with ease. He made me a, I asked him to make a picture and send it to me. On the right you see the difference between a very uh, light mug, a thin-rimmed mug on, on the left, and... Um, a narrow um, mini mouse muck, which is thick rimmed, which might be di more difficult to drink from. So when we go to the second stage, the chewing, tasting and bolus preparation, you have the food or liquid in your mouth. There the animals come in. On the left you see a small alligator. Alligators do have a tongue, but they don't. But it's attached to the floor of the mouth because alligators don't need a flexible tongue because they swallow their um, food as a whole. So they, they do have a tongue. I was surprised to see this, but they hardly use it. The same in birds. Please take the video. This is one of our chickens. That's how they eat. They don't chew, they just tear it from the leaf. So how do they digest? They chew with the stomach. This is a chicken stomach, which is very, very thick. It's muscle, two-thirds is muscle, and they collect small pebbles, and they chew with their stomach. We don't have such a stomach, so we have to chew with our teeth. So that's what happens. For good mastication, we used our teeth, our chewing muscles, a flexible tongue, and we need saliva. Because for bonus preparation, you use chewing to break the food down in smaller pieces, and this stimulates saliva production, and your tongue and cheeks push the food between the teeth, mix it with saliva, and at the same time, your tongue squeezes it against the palate. This is how we do it. And overall, I don't know whether you eat um, fish with the fish bones still in it. If you accidentally take a bite, including the fish bones, it's quite a job to get it out of your mouth. And that's also why we have a flexible tongue. The alligator doesn't mind. I might, I don't like to swallow my fish bones. So chewing is needed to uh, masticate a hard food. But it depends, of course, on the food. Whether it is beef or hard fruit, you need a lot of chewing. When it's soft food, you need a little chewing. And when it's liquid, you don't need chewing at all. I'd like to demonstrate to you normal chewing behavior. And I videotaped for this purpose a few of my colleagues who are willing to cooperate in this small experiment. On the left, you see one of my colleagues chewing. Yes, start the video. And just watch normal chewing behavior. You never watch your own chewing, so it's helpful to watch someone else's chewing. You see her cheeks work. You see her jaw going up and down. Okay, but I need to drink. And she says it's hard to swallow without a liquid. If you don't have enough saliva or um, maybe a little bit nerves, you need a little bit liquid to make it into a good bolus. The other demonstration is with this colleague. I ask her, could you please try and be careful to take a big bite of apple and at the same time do a conversation with someone else. So chew and talk at the same time. And please observe the automatic bolus control, the automatic swallowing in between talking, and realize that this is dual tasking. She's doing two things at the same time. And she's doing it, well, perfectly correct, but observe the fine coordination in normal chewing. Yes, go ahead.
Ik ben het weekend naar Gent geweest. Hm. Dat was erg leuk. Erg leuk. Even Veel gegeten. Even Met vrienden zijn we naar Gent geweest. Veel naar het museum. Rond gekeken in de stad. Erg gezellig. Aanrader? Wat zeg je? Aanrader? Het is zeker een aanrader. Ja. Even nou, ik zal het op. Now she has swallowed it. That is perfect coordination. That is how we are wired to do this in perfect coordination. She can talk, chew, swallow, all in coordination. And it looks, it's so easy. Um, I want to show it again and g give another comment. Please observe again. Can you see how many times she is swallowing? You have to look very carefully. Can I get it again? <laughs> Ik hmm? ben het weekend naar Gent geweest. Hmm. Dat was erg leuk. Erg leuk. Even Veel gegeten. Even Met vrienden zijn we naar Gent geweest. Veel naar het museum. Rond gekeken in de stad. Erg gezellig. Aanrader? Wat zeg je? Aanrader? Het is zeker een aanrader. Ja. Even Now it's all up. You see how complex swallowing is? And it's very difficult to observe how many times she has swallowed. So that's why in patients we want to use instrumental assessment, uh, registering muscle activity to observe carefully how often someone swallows, etc. Et so if anything goes wrong, talking and chewing at the same time can be dangerous. I'd like to do the second intermezzo with the mini stroke waffles. So, um, assistants are now handing out to you um, Dutch stroke waffles. I brought from the Netherlands for you, as if you don't have cookies, but I thought it would be nice to bring Dutch cookies. So we have, stroke waffles are famous in the Netherlands, and, but I thought if I bring the full stroke waffles, I'm looking at people chewing for minutes and minutes. So I brought the mini ones. And I'll wait until everyone has one stroke waffle. And I'll explain to you what I would like you to do. To take, well, a large bite, if you dare. And while you are chewing, observe what is your tongue doing and observe can you indeed breathe in between? How does it work in your mouth? Just observe. Chew and observe what happens. They can even be this big. When you buy it on the market, they're this big, round. And if you buy it in the shop, it's this big. Okay, any comments? What happens with your tongue? It, it lifts under, under it, yes? Huh? It pushes the food up. Mm -hmm. How do you get it between your teeth, yeah? Yes, it brings it up and to the side of your mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes, when you swallow, you can't breathe. Yes. And don't try to breathe because <laughs> that goes wrong. Yes. So y your brainstem makes you stop breathing the moment you start swallowing. And that is hardwired. That doesn't change immediately because you have Parkinson's. That's really hardwired. So you have to, don't have to be afraid immediately, but it helps if you are aware of the physiology. Yes. And another question, how much work does your tongue have to get it out of your mouth and <laughs> away from your teeth after you're done with chewing? That's a lot, yeah. 
And sometimes people forget that. It's not only the chewing, but it's also the cleaning again. That takes a lot of energy, coordination of your tongue. And that's another reason that some people prefer softer food. Not because they don't have the strength for chewing, but chewing is much more complicated than only strength. It takes your tongue, it takes coordination, it takes saliva, because some people now would like to have a sip of water. Yes, that's what you do, <laughs> to swallow it down. Yes. And the interesting thing with this kind of cookies is that the small um, parts of the cookies, when you don't swallow fully, you may inhale it, and that causes <coughs> this. So eating a cookie is very complicated. That was the demonstration. Okay. That's what you see in Parkinson's disease. That your chewing may be slower. Your bolus preparation may be slower. Drinking liquid may be slower. Your saliva production, however, is normal. That has been uh, studied by many people. The saliva production in Parkinson's is uh, normal. It's not uh, larger. can sometimes be less because of the levodopa. And we think that tongue strength is normal. However, we're not sure. We're still investigating that. Um, recently, we did that with a group of 33 Parkinson's patients who we asked to uh, press a bulb against the palate hard for a few seconds so we could assess, guess, assess maximal tongue strength. And we also assessed their endurance. How many seconds can they in, keep on pushing? And the interesting thing is that we didn't find any difference between pe people with Parkinson's and healthy controls. In uh, the groups over 70, the Parkinson patient even have larger, bigger tongue strength. However, when uh, related to endurance, that is more difficult for people with Parkinson's. So the strength seems to be okay. We're not done yet. It seems to be okay. But the endurance may be less. So what can you do? First, keep your teeth in good condition to avoid pain, but also to avoid uh, chewing problems. And if chewing is too demanding, take softer food, if you like. So instead of the beef, a softer fish, or instead of your sandwich, oatmeal or porridge or whatever. But it's up to you to choose that. If you say, it, I don't mind taking a long time to chew my food, that's your choice, of course. Then we go to swallowing onset. When you're done with chewing, you start swallowing. You experience that all the time. The onset of swallowing is voluntary. That's not a reflex. You do it yourself. However, it is very automated. You're not aware of it. We swallow 100 times a day, and we don't do it while being aware of it. We don't know how many times we swallow. Any idea how many times we swallow during the day? Anyone? 300? Any higher? 1,000? Well, it could be. It depends on what you eat, of course. So you swallow a lot when drinking and, and eating, but you also swallow saliva in between. It's very difficult to assess how often people swallow during 24 hours, but we have some figures. Um, daily, it's about 500 times. When you're awake, you swallow more or less every two minutes. And when you are asleep, it's about every four minutes to every 20 minutes. So when you're deep asleep, you only swallow once or twice an hour. So on average, 500 days. That's a lot. Here, regarding swallowing onset, I can show you an um, old x-ray we found, which is um, particular for Parkinson's in the advanced stage. Yes, start the video. Here you see this patient, he has a bolus in his mouth, but he is putting it backwards and forwards, but he's not able to start the swallowing. And that can be typical in some people with Parkinson's. Okay. When you swallow, you push your food into your throat. And um, as I explained earlier, when it's pushed into your throat, you close the way to your nose and you close the way to your trachea. Otherwise, you aspirate or it goes back through your nose and you want the esophagus to open and to push it down in your esophagus. This is more or less what you see on the 
after a left video, you see an X-ray of this. Someone chewing, pushing the bolus in the pharynx. Oops, gone. That is how it is supposed to be. Yes. What you see here is your, your larynx or your voice box is, is going up and down. I'll show you what happens when you observe it on the outside. This is, uh, again, one of my colleagues. You can start the video and see what happens if he drinks water. This is the Adam's apple going up and down. So you can feel it in your own throat and you can imagine if hypokinesia is becoming severe, the going up and down also is going slower. So getting the food in the esophagus is going slower. So sometimes the residue stays in your throat. And that's what we see indeed in people with Parkinson's. Residue of food after the swallow, drinking is slower or food or liquid is aspirated in the trachea. We first look at the video on the left where we will see residue. This is the residue of a cookie. You see it here. Swallow again. This is the residue. And most of it is going in the esophagus, which we do not see because the esophagus is always closed unless, um, except during the moments that you are swallowing, but at that moment you can't see it. You only see the trachea. So this is re residue. And the risk of it is that you, if you start breathing again, you inhale that residue. That is why some people <coughs> have when they eat a cookie. It's the small residue that you inhale. That can be a cause. The other problem is, although very mildly what you can see on the right video, This patient is swallowing some yogurt. So it goes down quite well. You see the tremor. However, there is some, here you see some white on the vocal cords here in the trachea. So this is trace, what we call trace aspiration. If it is more severe aspiration, which you can see um, very clearly during this kind of instrumental assessment, it may become a risk. So what can you do? That's the most important thing, of course. What can you do? You can um, ask your speech pathologist for direct training to overcome the hypokinetic swallowing. When residue is a problem, you have to train yourself with the help of your speech pathologist to squeeze harder. Overcome your hypokinesia, squeeze harder, so all the food goes down in your esophagus. Squeeze harder, swallowing faster. And it's um, a similar approach to um, improving your speech as is taught to you in this center. Speaking louder with intent, it can also be swallowing harder with intent. It's exactly the same approach to overcome the hypokinesia. Another way of doing it is using indirect treatment to overcome the hypokinetic swallowing. We know now that as a side effect of voice training programs like um, the Lee Silverman voice treatment, which was demonstrated a few months ago in a poster on the Movement Disorders Congress in Vancouver, speak out. We know, uh, I heard from several of you uh, through Samantha that you experienced the same. If you do your speech exercises, also your swallowing improves. And we also know it from um, the therapists in the Netherlands who use the pitch limiting voice treatment. That is our approach. All these speech approaches are basically the same, speaking louder to overcome the hypokinesia. Speech and swallowing are different motor programs in the brain, but they, are invol they involve the same muscles. So overcoming hypokinesia, making your muscles a little bit stronger by speaking louder, it makes sense that it at the same time improves your swallowing, but it's an indirect treatment. There's another approach, expiratory muscle strength training or EMST. 
That's a technique where patients are taught to breathe hard in a device to uh, train their expiratory strength so that at, um, it's the same kind of... It, it's another exercise, but it has the same effect that your breathing gets better, your expiratory strength gets better, but also your swallowing gets better because you train the, this head-neck musculature. So this also helps as an indirect training for swallowing disorders. In advanced Parkinson's, we see more that people need to adapt their, again, their uh, food consistencies, like in difficulty with chewing, with difficulty with swallowing. When swallowing hard is not possible, you adapt your food into soft food or maybe even liquid. The other problem is the aspiration of liquid and food. There are several causes, but these are two causes that you can uh, do something on by yourself. Dual tasking and unsafe head posture. And keep in mind that if you aspirate food or liquid, you may also aspirate saliva. And saliva contains bacteria. So even if you don't drink uh, or eat at all, but aspirate your saliva, you could still get an aspiration pneumonia. So swallowing is important also for swallowing saliva. This is aspiration. And to make it... Um, a bit more complex, but it is the reality in Parkinson's disease that the hyperkinesia can also influence your coughing. Because if you aspirate and you can cough it up strongly, there's no problem. But if your coughing is hypokinetic, getting um, less effective, then it may have consequences. And we know now, and this is a whole new area in research of Parkinson's disease, that people with Parkinson's disease may have a reduced urge to cough, reduced cough intensity. And we now also know by good research that voluntary cough is stronger than reflex cough. And that's hyperkinesia. If you do it intentionally, it's better than if you do it spontaneously. If you show the video, Hunter, you can see what I mean with coughing. This is coughing. But it has to be effective and it has to be strong enough. What can you do about that? Two things. Avoid double tasking. Don't talk while eating or drinking. Which one of you already is applying that technique? Yes? Because you experienced that that works? Mm -hmm. She had problems when drinking something. Okay, you de she developed hiccups. Okay, so concentrating on eating and drinking helped you with this problem. Yeah, yes. Yes. Well, if you have this in your head with intent, it is applicable to everything. Yes, also when you're swallowing. You already know that. The problem is, of course, that we humans like to talk while we are socially active. So, except from don't talk while you're eating and drinking, if you are socially interactive, first finish swallowing intentionally and then start talking. That's a habit you can train yourself to, to do. The other thing is to prevent unsafe head posture. If you have a narrow glass and you put your head um, um, backwards, it's more, you're more prone to choke if you have your head backwards than if you have your head in a neutral position. So, or you take the sip and swallow only if your head is in a neutral position, or you use another kind of glass. This is a very wide glass, and I learned this cue or this uh, compensation from a person with Parkinson's disease. These glasses are used in Belgium and in the Netherlands for drinking beer. We have all kinds of beer and every beer has its own glass and there are quite some beers who have this kind of white glasses. So this is learned from a Parkinson's patient, that is an important remark. And when I discussed it with colleagues here in America, they say, well, we don't have these glasses, but we have mar margarita glasses. So you can do it with a margarita glass. 
Well, I don't have margarita glasses at home. I have such glasses, but it does work. It does compensate. You don't have to bend your head oh, um, backwards. So if any of you has other suggestions, I collect this kind of compensations to share with other people. So the last stage, through the esophagus, well, that is not particularly the, es the expertise of a speech pathologist, but we know that through the esophagus, the passage can be slower. Uh, some people have reflux, so a concept of the stomach comes up, and some people with PSP might have impulsive swallowing, and if you are a poor chewer, if you chew your food poorly, it might get stuck in your esophagus. Not in your throat, but in your esophagus. That's another problem, but chew your food properly, as your mother taught you. So swallowing pills can be another problem. Some people have swallowing difficulty with swallowing pills, other people's not at all. In my experience, it's important to look individual what is the problem. And the solution might be another head posture, a larger water bolus, a thicker bolus, for example, applesauce. But keep in mind, not with um, cheese or yogurt because of the proteins that conflict with the levodopa. So when you take your medication with a thicker consistency, use applesauce, but not yogurt, and no Dutch cheese. Only afterwards, not during taking your medication. I'd like to share with you also this video, which was made by a colleague of mine in the Elkley Hospital in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. And this is a patient who struggled with swallowing his pills because he had difficulty with the start of the swallowing. So he could eat and drink, but when he had a pill in his mouth, he couldn't start the swallowing. So together they invented this technique, this cue. Yes, you can start a video so we can see what happens, how we managed to get it done. He takes a pill. Naar voren kijken. Slikken. Ja, nog eentje. Schudden. Naar voren kijken. Slik. So that worked for him. Don't do this, this at home <laughs> on your own. This worked particularly for him. But it's also a demonstration that a um, lot of solutions are are should be personalized. What works as a compensation or a cue for one person doesn't work for another person. That is why you need therapists who understand Parkinson's and are willing to work with you. If not, if that doesn't work at all, you can also go to the pharmacist because some people may um, profit from smaller pills, some may profit from larger pills. For some people, they need to be liquidized or whatever. That's another profession, but very helpful too. So, adequate nutrition and medication is vital. Take action when you lose weight unwanted. Have your swallowing checked by a speech pathologist or your nutritional intake by a dietitian. You may need adapted consistencies, or you may need um, a blender in your kitchen, or you may need medical nutrition. And we even developed in the Netherlands and in Belgium a cooking book special for Parkinson's, people with Parkinson's disease. It's only available in Dutch at the moment, but you never know. The final subject I want to discuss with you is drooling of saliva. We also have a questionnaire to assess the severity and frequency of drooling of saliva. So patients have to choose what the severity is. I... Um, um, lose saliva from my mouth or I don't lose saliva but I feel accumulation of saliva in the mouth because it's not a matter of having too much saliva but if you don't swallow you know, it accumulates that's usually the first sign and regarding frequency it can be less than one day or uh, once or twice a day or more times a day we described it in particular to have um, to be sure that patients can easily say how frequent it occurs. Saliva is a useful um, material for chewing, of course, as we already discussed. It's important for oral health. It's important when you speak. And let's be honest, it's also important for intimate kissing. Saliva is very important in our lives. So if saliva production is normal in Parkinson's disease, then what causes drooling? 
Well, to be honest, at this moment, we still do not exactly understand how it works, but we know that it is multifactorial. Like many problems, it's multifactorial, and we do think that these are parts of the complex of the pathophysiology of drooling. We know that some people have an open mouth while they are not aware of it, and that is an important predictor. Hyperkinetic swallowing, small and slow swallowing adds to it, stoop posture, and very important, distraction. Here it is the dual tasking again. When you're distracted by doing something, reading, or picking something up from the ground, you're not aware that saliva has accumulated. It's very easy that it drops from your mouth. We also have a questionnaire to assess this further. Do we experience loss of saliva during the night? Does your loss of saliva impair you eating or drinking? Does it impair your speech? What do you have to do to remove it? Does it limit you in your contact with others? Does it limit you in doing activities inside or outside? Or how bothered are you as a result of your loss of saliva? This is our way to assess the severity of this complaint. So what can you do about it? Basically, three important things. First, be aware that saliva in your mouth is normal. If you feel it accumulate, swallow. If you can't swallow it anymore, go to a speech pathologist. Observe when exactly you drew, because it's hardly ever in the office of the speech pathologist or the neurologist. It's at home. And if I can't see it, I can't help you with understanding how to solve it. So many times I advise people, ask someone else to videotape your drooling at home so we can help you understand how it happens in your case. And thirdly, find a speech pathology to help you analyze what is the cause and to find an individ individualized solution or cue to swallow. If that doesn't work, and that is in um, not many cases, but it can be that that is not enough, then you need medical treatment to reduce your saliva production if you want. Um, some medications have dry mouth as a side effect and um, a moderate or severe influence have botulinum toxin injections or radiotherapy to damage the salivary glands. That is done only in very severe cases of drooling, but it can help people to improve their quality of life because constant drooling limits very severely your social activities. So, the summary slides. I discussed with you taking food, chewing, swallowing it, and get it into your esophagus. You learned that swallowing can make your swallowing slow and maybe also risky, in particular in advanced Parkinson's disease and atypical Parkinsonism. The main causes is that swallowing gets slow and small, and dual tasking is a problem. So what can you do? In summary, swallow harder, Avoid double tasking, look with your speech pathologist for individual cues, and prevent unwanted weight loss. So to give you a final overview of what is related to swallowing and which professionals you might um, meet during your journey, so to say, in the middle is you with Parkinson's and swallowing disorders. This is the swallowing disorder. You may experience um, the need to adapt your food consistencies, adapt medication, have medical, medic um, medical nutrition, uh, changes in um, the mugs and uh, utensils you use. But also, um, a problem before that can be the difficulty with cutting your food. On the other side, I showed you how we can assess it with endoscopy, uh, radiology, that it may have consequences for your lungs, that you need coughing to stay healthy. And if your food um, arrives in your, your stomach uh, to digest it, you need the rest of your digestive system. And just one remark that obstipation is also a problem in people with Parkinson's disease. So we have it from one end to the other. The neurologist and the Parkinson nurse, if you have that, are the most important people around you to organize what you need. Here's the speech pathologist. 
and we're involved in the swallowing, but we have our tentacles in all the other areas. That is what we like. But you may also need a dentist, or you may also need a pharmacist, a pharmacologist, or a dietitian, or an occupational therapist. It depends on what your problem is. Or you may um, meet an otolaryngologist, or a radiologist, or a physical therapist, or a gastroenterologist, and here's the dietitian again for the obstipation. So it's not only swallowing, we discussed swallowing, but it is related with eating, drinking, and staying healthy. So my advice is, if you meet other professions, try to cooperate with each other and try to have you, the professionals cooperate together and work with you. So this is really the last slide. Adequate nutrition is vital. I'd like to acknowledge here my colleagues of Parks and Nets, my colleagues of the Rappert UMC and the Elkleek Ziekenhuis and the patients and caregivers who were willing to share their experience with you. And for you, stay healthy and keep your swallowing safe. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Kalf for giving this presentation. We have about 15 minutes for Q&A. If you have a question, raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you. Please wait till the microphone gets to you so the people watching live right now can hear your question. I noticed you said that you need a larger bath glass, but we tend to drink out of water bottles. What is your recommended? Whatever it's good for you. Water bottles are excellent, white glasses. Whatever you experience is making it easier for you. Okay, but you don't recommend we don't do water bottles? No. Okay. No, not at all, no. If you're okay with drinking from water bottles, it's fine. Yep. Question over there. Do you or do you not recommend the use of a straw while drinking? Well, it's the same. Um, I can give the same answer, actually, if with um, drinking from water bottles. Observe what happens. People with tremor may need a straw to avoid that the coffee is spilling all over. So then a straw is very helpful. And if people start choking every time they use a straw, then the straw is not very helpful. So straws in general are okay, bottles are okay, unless you experience a problem. So there's no rule about s straws. Just find out what works the best. Other questions? Wait a minute, until the microphone is with you. How important is the right measurement of protein? The right measurement of protein? Mm. Well, the most important thing is when you take your swallow your pills that you don't do it with protein at the same time. So if you eat your cheese, um, uh, an hour later, it's, it's okay. Um, I can't answer your question if it is related to protein intake in general. That's a question you have to ask to a dietitian. Did you say early on in the, your, uh, your demonstration that if you have the swallowing issue early on in Parkinson's, it's an indication that it's maybe a serious different type of it's not the atypical Parkinson's, it could be... That may be the case, yes. Neurologists and allied health professionals are trained to watch this kind of uh, problems. And we know that um, swallowing problems, severe swallowing problems, for example, needing a pack tube or um, uh, important adaptations of your food, severe swallowing problems, but also, for example, when people... A fall very often that is in general not related with Parkinson's disease. So it's a sign to look further and to check whether it is Parkinson's disease. It's not that if you have severe swallowing that you by definition don't have Parkinson's disease. It's a red flag, which mean, means that in general people have to look further to be sure about the diagnosis because that may have consequences for the treatment. Do you recommend a uh, modified barium swallow? Do I recommend a modified barium swallow? Just as a baseline? No, not, not as a baseline measure. 
Um, well, it depends on um, what the agreements are in your hospital or your healthcare system. Um, I mean, in, in the Netherlands, we don't do it as a baseline measure. We only do it in patients who have clear swallowing disorders, which we don't understand uh, correctly. Could you clarify weight loss a little more? <laughs> if you have unexpected weight loss, in other words, your diet hasn't changed that much, and all of a sudden you're experiencing weight loss, yeah. is that a, a signal? Yeah. I know I raised the subject myself, but I cannot answer your question. Because I'm not an expert in weight loss. You should, can ask a dietitian or your neurologist. We only know that unwanted weight loss is, is not a good, there must be a reason for that. Sometimes it is related to, to um, swallowing disorders. And I put it up because sometimes we see patients who are, um, have difficulty with swallowing, which is a bit out of balance with their disease severity. And sometimes we see patients who because of um, loss of appetite or, or whatever, start to eat less and less, they become underweight malnutrition, they have a mild disorder, and because of the underweight, they, the swallowing disorder increases, sometimes even up to the point that they're unable to eat and drink safely and they need um, tube feeding. And, when, and I've experienced several times that people say, yeah, well, you're right, the weight loss was becoming a problem, but no one was noticing it. That is why I mention it. Unwanted weight loss is never good. But if in a specific case you want to understand what causes it and your swallowing is okay, for that reason you should go to a dietitian or back to your neurologist. These are the experts on weight loss. Yeah. But it's important to keep in mind. Yes, please. A 13 second timing for that. What would you expect for a normal person to have for a timing of swallowing that amount of water? Well, normally between 10 to 15 seconds, so it was not really abnormal. However, it depends on, um, on age and how, how large you are. Because the larger your head, the larger your throat, the quicker you can drink. So it, it depends on several factors. And I know from experience from someone, you may also do it within eight seconds. So officially you're still safe, but if I look at you, you, you can do it within a six or eight seconds. So when I watch, when I observe you, I can see this, your Parkinson in your swallowing. And then you admit it because you said, you, you, your eating is slowing down, so it, it fits. Yeah? If I want to time myself at home, how much water do I use? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. When that, when, when we're now starting self-assessment. <laughs> well, the most important thing, if you want to be sure that you don't have swallowing disorder, is, is choking. If you start choking on food or liquid more than once a week, that is not supposed to be, be normal. So I can't go ahead and try to see how long it takes me to do Oh, yes, oh, yes. If you. <laughs> well. It may not relate with, with any swallowing complaint. Remember the, the slide I showed you with the frequency, the, the difference between subjective swallowing and objective swallowing. Um, so it, it depends on what you want to know. If you monitor yourself in how much, if you start choking more often when drinking coffee, um, that would be a reason to do further assessment. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, we do it when the camera is off. <laughs> we'll have a contest. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. Any other questions from this part of the room? Um, you mentioned about the, 
the teeth and the debris and stuff yeah. like that. Um, here, the, the normal thing is to get two cleanings a year. Um, is it recommended for uh, people with Parkinson's to get an additional cleaning? Oh, that's a difficult question um, because um, I don't know. I raised it again myself. That's on the area of, of the of the dentist. I would, I think it would be recommendable if people have um, not enough saliva. For example, if people drool severely and they get medication to give them or uh, injections to give them a dry mouth, so they have less saliva than they should be. That is a reason to extra monitor the condition of your teeth because you need saliva to keep your teeth in a good condition mm -hmm. to prevent cavities. Mm -hmm. Because it's so, my answer would be if you have treatment for your saliva, yes, then I think that would be wise. But in general, for people with Parkinson's, I don't think so. Okay, cause I, well, I, I called the insurance company and, and, uh, and this past week and just got, and got permission to get an extra cleaning. Okay, okay. <laughs> so. Well, I think it's always good for your teeth to keep them in the best shape you can, you can have. Well, I have medication that gives me dry mouth during the night when I sleep. Mm -hmm. And so I've taken special tablets that I put in my mouth at nighttime mm -hmm. and they create saliva. Mm -hmm. so. so during the nighttime, you have a wet pillow or... No, not no, at no. all. Okay, no, okay. it's all okay, within perfect. my mouth. The okay. saliva is within my mouth. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, and yes. actually it says it's probably good for preventing cavities. Uh-huh, yes. Well, if you want to be sure, check with your dentist. That's the specialist yeah. in this case, yeah. Yeah. From the standpoint of a caretaker, if someone doesn't realize that they are having incidents of um, swallowing yep. difficulties. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other things that a caretaker can look for that might be other than a, the reflexive cough or something? Is mm -hmm. that like, I think watery eyes or something like that sometimes indicates choking, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Are, there, are there any other things that watery a Watery eyes can look or at? a wet gurgling voice, okay. for example. Yes. Yeah. And if you want to be sure that you interpret the signs correctly, ask a speech pathologist to observe with you because they are experienced in, in, in seeing the small signs. Yeah. Someone behind you? Would that also include like the um, chronic clearing of your throat a, a lot during the day? Is that considered more of a, just a habit or is that a, a precursor to choking? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, you mean um, often during the day, <coughs> this? Yeah. Yes, yes, okay. That's what many people have, yeah. That can have um, um, a few reasons. That can be difficulty with swallowing saliva. So saliva gets accumulated not in the mouth, but in the throat. And because you don't feel it, it has your, your body temperature, it can easily come into your, your larynx and the moment it comes to your <coughs> you do this. It can indeed also be a habit because if you <coughs> constantly do this, it irritates your vocal cords and it makes mucus. So it can be both. But I think in most people with Parkinson's, it's probably accumulation of, of saliva or it's um, a way of getting mucus from, from the lungs up Instead of coughing, <coughs> you feel there is something and you try to do it like this. And again, if you're not sure and if you want a good answer, ask a speech pathologist to observe with you. Yes. <laughs> How do we get your scarf? I bought it um, on Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, and I saw it for the first time in my life, and I saw, they have it. So, tourist jobs. It's, it's a tourist thing. Does a running nose have anything to do with Parkinson? 
Yes, but we don't know why. It is um, a known um, complaint. It's described, there's literature about it, but I can't explain it for you. But it's, it's a known complaint, yes. I know more people I know that has a running nose do not have yep. any Parkinson. Yeah. Well, I so, heard something. Would it just be an allergy? The, the, the taxes allergies. Um, do, do, does that cause runny nose? Yes. Okay, okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one over there. But the runny nose only occurs at a certain time of the day. Okay, tell me. It's weird. Tell me. It's like late afternoon, evening, and then it's gone in the morning when you get up. Okay. And then it's back about 2 o'clock. It's weird. That's weird. Okay. And it's, it, it doesn't relate with your medication? It almost chokes you and stuff. It's weird. Okay. It causes you to have a swallow like forced to swallow. Okay. Because you feel it in your nose and it's coming from your your nose in your back throat. of your throat. Okay. But okay. it's not there all day long. Okay. I'm afraid we have to study that further and find people who have exact the same complaint and investigate whether it is related to medication um, inside outside the house or whatever. But it can be very complicated, but so, well, we still don't understand. Yep. Yep. Uh, you can read if you like the Parkinson's manual that you'll see in your neurologist or your movement specialist's office. They all have it. It's gray. I read it from cover to cover mm -hmm. for my husband. And the, there is a Parkinson's running nose. And it doesn't matter what time of day in our house. Okay. And he's totally unaware of it. Okay. When it happens until you look at him and you see it about to drop in his dinner or something, you know, and you say, would okay. you like a Kleenex? No, I'm yes. serious. Yeah, you don't yeah, yeah. even, you yep. don't have the sensory perception to know that your yep. nose is about to drip. And it's not even always like, well, you really need to blow your nose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just it, it, a constant it, it, yes. sort of. Yes, it, it's more subtle. Yeah. And it explains it in that book. Yep. Everybody who yep. ought to read that book. But, but you mentioned an important thing, the sensory awareness. No, and then that's, that's, that's making it much more complicated and many problems in Parkinson's that it's, you're not aware of everything. And that can be sensory awareness or cognitive awareness. And that's part of the, the Parkinson's. So you don't do it on purpose. It's just not there. Well, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yes, the feedback system because of the basal ganglia is, is, is reduced, and that's in everything. That's in walking, talking, swallowing, everything, yes. Yes, and we have to take that in account in the treatment and you, in your um, exercise, yeah. All right, unfortunately, that's all the time we have left for questions, but let's give another big round of applause to Dr. Koff for being here.